So the world was a pretty different place when I started at Brown. The iPhone hadn't been invented, and so we had never seen touchscreen technology. People typically weren't walking around with an eight megapixel camera in their back pocket. Uh, Twitter was not yet founded, so we had no sense of the importance of 140 characters. And people actually watched television on a TV. Or if they were pretty advanced, Netflix mailed them a DVD. And now things are a little bit different. And content is everywhere. And images are really the central part of exploring that content, which is a really exciting time for me because I've been trying to understand how humans see and respond to images for the best part of my career. I came to Brown to study the human visual system. I started my work with Professor Michael Tarr and Professor David Scheinberg, and we were looking at how humans see faces. And not just regular faces, we were interested in understanding how you see other race faces. So some of you may be familiar with an effect known as the other race effect, where if you are born into a community where you see just one predominant race, you can effortlessly distinguish between those faces. But then, in fact, faces of other races can be hard to tell apart. And we were interested in how does this well-known perceptual bias impact our social and emotional decisions? So we set about to train so that people could tell the difference between these faces. And what we were able to discover is actually when people can see the difference between other race faces, it removes their social bias or it ameliorates it to some degree. And for me, that opens up a new question, which is maybe everything we see in the world has an emotional response associated with it. And maybe even objects and images of the everyday that we might think of as being neutral actually generate a very subtle emotional response. And so my, in my thesis, I asked the question, is anything in our visual world ever neutral? And we started to look into behavioral response. We used functional MRI. And we figured out that, in fact, yes, like even objects that you would typically think of as neutral, chairs, watches, actually possess a small affective response that, that we called valence. Um, and knowing this valence, you could predict the likelihood that people would choose an image. And so as I was finishing my PhD, I really thought, maybe this is useful. Maybe there is someone somewhere in the world that would want to know the type of images that people would choose. And I'm going to share a story with you now that I don't typically talk about uh, when I tell this story. But I want to go back to the time, how I was feeling at that time. So I was excited about the science. I knew that there was some one somewhere that, that would want to use it, that it could have a big impact. But I was really shy and kind of almost embarrassed to say to my colleagues, maybe we could start a business on this, or maybe we could take this out of the university. <laughs> and so I turned up on Dean Weber's doorstep. I had never met him, but I was, I was finishing up. And, and I said, you know, I want to talk to someone about this. I've had an amazing time at Brown. I've loved my PhD. You know, we've published papers. I could do a traditional postdoc, but I'm thinking about this other path. And he said something that has really stayed with me to this day. He said, Sophie, if you've discovered something that can disseminate knowledge and create jobs, then you've done everything that Brown trained in you. And you should hold your head up high and go out into the world and figure it out. So I was like, OK, <laughs> how am I going to figure it out? <laughs> uh, and at that time, the National Science Foundation had launched a program called Innovation Core. And the Innovation Core program is designed for scientists or engineers who have NSF-funded research that they think has a commercial potential, but they don't know what they're doing. Um, and it's a course 
uh, different from a lot of the NSF's typical programs. It's taught by entrepreneurs and venture capitalists, and they put you through this grueling three-month program where you try to figure out, is there a commercial potential? Is there a product in my science? And through that program, we realized, actually, there is a need, and that need at the moment is in the video space. So online video was really gaining momentum, and there were a lot of companies out there that needed to get more views on their video content. And they asked us, well, if you know what image people like, will you be able to pick the frame from the video to represent it? And I thought, yeah, that's actually a really interesting problem to solve, and we can do that. Um, and so we set about forming a team. So I had an expertise in cognitive neuroscience, but I brought together a group of people from machine learning, computer vision, large-scale system architecture, software engineering design. And together, we built a product that can take in any amount of video and select the frame to represent that video or the thumbnail to drive video views. People often ask, how is it different? How is it different doing research in a startup as opposed to doing it in academia? And I think, you know, one of the things that's particularly interesting is the scale. So, I remember when I was in the lab, if we had brought 30 people in for a week, that was a big week, and we'd collected a lot of data. Today, Neon served over a billion thumbnails. We have people seeing and responding to our images 24 hours a day globally. Uh, you know, our images have told a story around events like the Winter Olympics through to the Syrian conflict to today we're representing the coverage of the Ryder Cup. And so by working with these large-scale media publishers, we suddenly have so much data to be able to solve the problem of how people see and respond to images. And I think another question that people often ask is, you know, but is it fun? What is the most fun part of being part of an early stage company out in the valley? And it's interesting. I, I would be lying if I said there's not a lot of fun in meeting people, finding yourself in these unpredictable situations. But I think one of the most special moments for me was when we were all sitting in the office and the first thumbnail went live on a newspaper's website. And I realized that the algorithms that selected that image had come from science that we had worked on here at Brown. And to see that translated and to see that image live in the wild, driving views, was an incredibly powerful moment for me. So as I look to, to the future, I think that I'm still in a very privileged position to be conducting research within a slightly different format than I was before, but myself and my team are still very much interested in understanding how we see and respond to images. Thank you.